ຊົ່ວສະໄດຖ້າໃຫ້ນີ້ຍັງຂ້ອຍມີພິຍົນພິຍົນຈະປິເສດໄດ້ຈະແນ່ນະບົນເລື່ອງໃຫ້ຈະ
So I am born only as a result of my parents escaping. And so you all know about the genocide that killed six million Jews, but also yes. gypsies, homosexuals. The Nazis did a very good job of killing people. Of course, this, there's a parallel, and that is what happened in Cambodia. I don't know what the numbers are, because nobody knows the numbers mm -hmm. from 1.7 million. And in our film, Ambassador John Gunther Dean, the last US ambassador, said three million. So I don't know what the true number is, but uh, enormous number of Cambodians died. And uh, Cambodia had its Holocaust. Yes. Uh, and, but our movie is not just doom and gloom. It's mm -hmm. also about not just the past, but the future. But we go all the way into the past. We go into, you know, the ancient, you know, essentially ancient Cambodia when it was a great empire. We talk about how it was chiseled down by Vietnam and Cambodia, how the king uh, asked for French help in order to reclaim some of the land. Uh, we, we have a, if you see this movie, I think you'll get a, a really good lesson in history, including how the Vietnam War was one of the contributors to the Pol Pot regime or the rise of the Khmer Rouge. Yes, um, I re believe, if I remember correctly, there are two, um, speakers on your film that um, praise Vietnam for invading because they believe that if the Vietnam didn't come in on time, they truly believe that the Pol Pot would have killed everyone. Do you agree with that? Yeah, I think the Vietnamese really stopped the killing. Yeah, I, I tend to agree. And then the Vietnamese stayed on. And so mm -hmm. then that, that's the other question. And, yes. but yeah, I think the Vietnam rescued Cambodia there might have been nothing left by the time. The Khmer Rouge were not only killing, you know, people who had glasses or people who were intellectuals, but they started turning on themselves. So their cadre, they were killing their own people because they were convinced that they were, you know, traitors within their ranks. And it, be it became a kind of sickness. And I think the Vietnamese did stop it. Uh, so you have to give credit where credit is due. Yeah, I guess it depends on who you talk to. That's but right. In my opinion, I also, you know, think that the Vietnamese did a good job for, for coming in and save us because if that wasn't the case, I wouldn't be here and my parents wouldn't be here. And then if it wasn't my parents and I to be here, my children wouldn't be born. So to me, it's, it depends on who you talk to. Be, I think some of the elder generation still has a lot of tension feelings for the Vietnamese, so they refuse to see the good side of it, but then the newer generations um, see the benefit of that. Well, I mean, there's this long-standing thing about Southern Vietnam, which was originally part of Cambodia. Well, it's mm -hmm. called Krom, um, I'm having, you know. Oh, it's a Khmer Krom. Khmer Krom. Yes. And, but that's ancient history in a sense. Yes. Um, and so sometimes politically people whip up, you know, the Cambodians to become anti-Vietnamese. But I think, yeah, as you say, I think the Vietnamese stopped the killing and that's a big deal. That was important. But by the way, nobody in this business is, are angels, right? Politically, yeah. everybody has their own agenda. No motives are ever pure. That's, that's humanity. That's the way politics work. That's the way governments work. Nothing is black and white. That's the best way to put it. Now, what was your interest in doing the film? They call it Myanmar. Um, I wanted to go there because you couldn't get in, and A, and secondly, you could not film there. It was illegal to film. And I, so I managed to get a, a work for the embassy as a senior specialist teaching, working with filmmakers, but that was my way in the front, in the back door, let's say. And so I was sneaking around filming and in the past, I had always used crews to work with me, cameramen and you know, people to light, take sound. And this was a case where I couldn't have that, so I decided to shoot myself. And it, it turned out okay that I had been a still photographer and I, I can frame things and I think I know how to shoot. And so I got into trouble a couple of times, but I, I'm good at talking my way out of things. So. Wow. Uh, but I, I did the same thing. I, I sort of came to like that style of filming because uh, 
you have a very intimate conversation. It's just you and the per other person. Yes. And I use available light and I put a mic on them. I usually offer coffee, make sandwiches, whatever has to be done. And y y you get, as you'll see in this, in Anchor Awakens, people are very revealing. A Asians in general don't wear their hearts on their sleeve, as we tend to say. They don't mm -hmm. tell you everything. Mm -hmm. Right? Americans will yes. tell you anything, including, you know, their sex life. Yes, uh, just give them a glass of booze. <laughs> not even that. Just give them a glass of water and they'll start to tell you. Yes. Uh, Asians are more reserved, but, I, I, but you break that barrier if it's just you and me. If it's just two people talking, you start to really get a sense of who they are. And they, they, there's a matter of trust also. And I always tell people, look, if you say something that you regret, you just Put it, put it on camera and we'll make sure we don't include that thing. Just tell us. And so mm -hmm. I try to take the pressure off people and I want them to be comfortable, you know. And this right. is, a, I always ask at the end, uh, is there anything that I didn't ask you? Because I found sometimes you'll interview somebody for an hour, you turn off the camera and then suddenly the good stuff comes. Yes, that's true. So I, yeah, I, I, always, I always tell them also, the camera's off, and then wait 10 minutes. And they say, by the way, the camera was on. Is it okay if I use that material? So a little bit of trickery, but you know. Uh, but you get out what you, you want. You get what you want, yeah. I mean, there's a very upsetting scene in the film where this little boy breaks down, which shocked me. But we don't want to tell exactly what's in the movie, right? No, not yet. Um, we will come right back, and we will get into your part where you interview Han Sein, the most controversial man in the world, <laughs> I would Well, think. just the most controversial man in Cambodia. That's true. Okay, so we will be right back. Cambodia is coming back from the edge of the abyss. We've never seen in modern history, we haven't seen a culture completely eradicated and then come back like this. All of the educated people, the trained people, the doctors, the dentists, the architects, the lawyers, the engineers uh, were killed. Pol Pot really destroyed Cambodia to the ground. The trauma have left a big scar in Cambodian society. Cambodia in the early 1970s figured very prominently in U.S. politics, although we forget about that. The Kent State Massacre, for example, had to do with protests against not the war in Vietnam, but the U.S. incursion into Cambodia. The first articles of impeachment drawn against Richard Nixon had to do with the secret bombing of Cambodia, not with Watergate. You have to understand the history, but also the demography of the country. Half of the population is under 25 years old. 70% is under 35, 30 years old. So you have that massive youth generation coming into the time. The young look only forward. And they don't compare to the past that Cambodia has survived. They compare with other countries' present and future. You know what they were shouting at the demonstration? Hun Sen out. I think in Cambodia, you may have uh, a future that would be much different from the past and one that very few people have imagined. question would be, how were you able to get Hun Sen in front of a camera? That's a good question because Hun Sen does not give interviews. I think this was the first interview 
that has occurred in I don't know how long. I think once, maybe 20 years ago or 10 years ago was On BBC. On 2020 something, right? No, and BBC got an interview, but this oh. is a long time ago. So it's a long story. I, how long is your, your program? Is it a couple of hours long? Can I take a couple of hours? <laughs> well, I, I love hearing this story about how you were able to bypass the CIA. Anyhow, uh, let me go back in time. Uh, there was an article on the Associated Press Wire about John Gunther Dean, the last U.S. ambassador before the Pol Pot regime took over Cambodia. Mm. And the guy who wrote it is Dennis Gray, a correspondent in Thailand, and I contacted him and I asked him if he could give me the contact information for John Gunther Dean, the last U.S. ambassador. And he gave me his email and I sent John Gunther Dean an email. And I think it was the next day my phone rings and on the other end was John Gunther Dean calling from Paris. And so we st I told him what I was doing, the movie I was working on, and we start talking and I'm, I'm listening to him and I'm listening and listening. And I said, I suddenly shifted to German. I said, du kannst Deutsch, nicht wahr? You speak German, don't you? He said, ah, yeah, selbstverständlich, naturally. Mm -hmm. And we switched to German for a while. And then I asked him, like, uh, well, obviously you came to the United States with your parents. When did your parents come over? He said, 1939. And it's just a little bit after my parents escaped in 1938. And I asked him, what is, what did your father do? And he said, my father was a lawyer. Well, my father was a lawyer also, you know, in Vienna. Mm -hmm. And then I asked him, well, just where did you come to? You know, where in the United States? And he says, Kew Gardens in Queens in New York, which is where I grew up. And this is getting more interesting. And then I asked him, what school do you go to? And he said, public school 99, which is the school I went to when where I was always in trouble. Wow. And then he said to me, uh, um, s by the way, he said, I have a grandmother, maternal grandmother, whose last name is Lieberman, which is my last name. He said, you have to come to Paris. And I said, well, I just left Paris. I'm working on an animated film there. No, you have to come. I'll have a car waiting for you at the airport. You must come. You can stay with us, but you have to come. So I turned the airplane around and <laughs> flew back to Paris. And I, w I was met at the airport with a car, and, and I joined them in their lovely, huge apartment. And we, we interviewed him, for, I, or I interviewed him, for three days. Mm -hmm. And it, the interview obviously is in the film. And then as I'm gathering equipment and leaving and stepping through the door, I'm on the threshold, I turn back and I said, John, uh, by any chance, do you know Hun Sen? And he said, <laughs> oh like yes, that. of course, he's a friend. <laughs> oh really, I said, hmm, could you provide an introduction? And Dean, who's 90 years old or something, 90 something, sat down at his desk and longhand wrote out a letter, Dear Excellency, this is to introduce Robert Lieberman. So I took the letter and as soon as I got back to the United States, I gave it to the, uh, at least a copy of it, to the Cambodian embassy in Washington. And mm -hmm. they sent it on to Phnom Penh. And then Phnom Penh sent back with a question. So it goes back and forth and back and forth. Mm -hmm. And finally, they wanted to know what kind of questions I would ask the prime minister. So I invented some very nice, easy questions like, how do you see the economy in the next 10 years? Where do you see the country going? These kind of softball questions, as we call them. Mm -hmm. And then it comes back that he's coming to the United States. The United States? Yes, he's coming for the UN General Assembly. And so I was ready to pack up and run to Phnom Penh for that interview. And so it turns out he's coming to New York City. So I grabbed, well, grabbed Deborah Horde, my co-producer, David Cossack, who's our cameraman, and we went in a van and we drove to New York City. Of course, you can't park in New York. It's not like the rest of the world. <laughs> <laughs> so they pulled up in front and I got the equipment out and I managed to talk my way past the front desk and have a bellhop let me into his suite before he arrived. And so I loaded all the gear into the room where we'd be filming in his suite and then left. And then we went to sleep and next morning we appeared and there was, you know, New York City Police, Secret Service, 
and of course Hun Sen's entourage, people from the UN, and I don't know, so I assume some security people. And uh, then his secretary of state came out, a nice guy, and he was going to be the translator and introduced himself. And I said, fine. I, and I said, you know, uh, it's kind of interesting. Uh, we have all these bags we brought in the night before, and nobody has gone through them. Nobody has looked. And I turned to the cops there in the Secret <laughs> Service, and I turned to him, and I said, that's kind of interesting when it comes to security. And he said, oh, he says, we know who you are. I said, you do? And he, he opened the dossier, which had all my information in it. Uh. And then I asked him, you know, I said, look, would the prime minister be willing to, instead of using the prepared questions, would, oh, we have the answers, he said, before I could finish, to all my questions. I said, that's very nice. Do you think we could just sort of wing it and just do a sort of free-floating, you know, back and forth. And he said, well, why don't you ask the prime minister? Well, I waited and then the prime minister was led in by these women. They're rather humorless in, in uh, military uniforms. The, you know, most Cambodians are very, a lot of fun. They laugh. They're easy to laugh. Yes. They're easy to joke. with these women, mwah, they were not <laughs> laughing. And they came in and then the prime minister came in and we had to stand for him. We, we were introduced and he sat down. I said, uh, do you think you could, you know, let us just, you know, just speak naturally and I can ask you questions as we... He said, sure, why not? He was game. And so we went at it for two solid hours, wow. eyeball to eyeball. And, I, I've, you know, I've interviewed, you know, celebrities, po politicians, Aung San Suu Kyi, and you always have the feeling they're halfway out the door, mm -hmm. that, you know, you have a limited time. Uh-uh, Hun Sen... He actually, I, I ran out of questions. I turned to Deborah, my co-producer, and I said, Deb, do you have any questions? No, no, she said, you asked everything. And that was it. I mean, after two hours, he had worn me out, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so we have a, a very exclusive interview. Um, I think the, the Voice of America ha has gotten it, and I think they are, they're broadcasting parts of it. Um, Cornell University, I, we gave it to their archives. Uh, this film has been on BBC Global News, repeatedly shown. It's been on Australian television, and I'm sure Hun Sen's appearance helped in no small way. Let's watch this clip that is out of the two hours interview that you did with Prime Minister Hun Sen that caught my attention. <laughs> ตาแมริกาบ่ายสําหรับในกุศลใช่นะตาบ่ายแต่ลูกยัวอยากบ่ายแต่ตาโอบามาตึกบ้านเนี่ยโอบามาวิชั่นดูดูชุดนี่โอ
that they would crack down on, on the demonstration. Has it been screened in Cambodia? Just briefly, and unfortunately, there were mostly uh, expats who came. There were some Cambodians. The Cambodians who are in the film came. But I, I think it really needs to be screened. But in order to be screened, it has to pass the censors. And it's a whole process. But I would like to screen it. Or maybe it can be broadcast you know, by VOA or something. So Cam I think Cambodia, it's more important almost that the Cambodians see it. Um, and so we just had a screening at UCLA that I think you were there. Yes. And there were lots of Cambodian students, students there. Students, yes. It was well received, I thought. Yeah. In your opinion, do you think Prime Minister Hun Sen has seen the film, or at least the parts that I you interviewed? I have no idea. And I'm going back to Cambodia, and we'll see if I'm welcome. <laughs> <laughs> see if he's willing to sit down with you for two hours again? Again, I don't think he will be. Um, we'll have to see. It, it, it's, yeah, I, I mean, I've fallen in love with Cambodia and the people, and uh, I'm going back just to see friends, uh, and not, not for business and not for filming, just to see the Cambodians I know. I, uh, Cambodia has a way, when you first come there, you know, it's, you're not enamored necessarily, but it has a way of growing on you, and, yes, uh, right? Yes, yes, And the yes, people I also. I have to say the, the Cambodian people are very, very warm, always welcoming. Uh, they have a good sense of humor. They laugh easily. Uh, yes. They're just lovely people, and like yourself. Thank you. We're just shy for the first five seconds. After that, we're no longer shy, and we become welcome. And That's right. And one of the lady in the film mentioned that Cambodians have smiling face yes. and peaceful. And how did that kill their own people? Which I think she described Cambodian really well. We are peaceful. We are smiling people. What was your purpose of producing this film? I, I, I'm not sure of my purpose, to tell you the honest truth. I just wanted to, I, I like taking you, the viewer, into a country that you don't know. So I've done that in Myanmar or Burma. I've done it in Cambodia. I just came back from two months filming in Mongolia. Mm. Why Mongolia, right? Yes. I don't know. I think it's just interesting. These are places that we, in a West, this is really made for also for a Western audience. We don't know. And I think the young generation doesn't know, the Americans don't know how the American involvement in Vietnam and the incursion into Cambodia, a neutral country at the time, mm -hmm. uh, they don't know how we precipitated, it's not the only cause by a long shot, but we precipitated the, the rise of the Khmer Rouge. So um, young people don't know their history, and both the Cambodians don't know their history, and the American young people don't really know the history. And so, you know, I'm a teacher, but it's, this yes. is not a, uh, you know, this is not a movie that's teaching people, because educational movies are boring. Mm -hmm. So I think this is not a boring movie, but I don't know, you saw it. I don't it think boring? it was boring at all. <laughs> I think, matter of fact, I learned so much from the film in my 45 lives of existing, and I am Cambodian. And when my daughter was going to high school in Newport Beach, she said there's a section in history book that is not even half of a page of a Cambodian history. I think this film should be introduced in history class in the American schools so that they will get more ideas and really get to know Cambodia. But unfortunately, we will need a break and we will be right back. Post Khmer Rouge, there was a bit of a free for all as people tried to figure out where to live. Since that's the way it occurred, very few people have land titles. Land disputes in this country and evictions are one of the most pressing issues for the country as a whole. It's a massive problem and some people are pushing back because they weren't being compensated fairly for what they were losing. Often, the compensation will consist of a plot of land 30 kilometers out of town 
And if you suddenly live in an area where no one lives around you that needs a ride on a taxi or on a motorbike, you're cut off from public services as well. And not only your, your means of making a living, but simple things like the water might not be hooked up. You might not have electricity. They're being evicted from their homes in order to build, you know, expensive condos or, or buildings. They're being evicted from the land because th that land is being used essentially for plantations. And it, yeah, and there, there is compensation, but it really is not adequate as described in the film. Uh, you know, people can be from the city, for instance, moved out, far out. They don't have any services. And if they work in Phnom Penh, they have to somehow get into the city, which can cost them almost, you know, in and out. That could be a, day, you know, a day's earning. So it, it's these people are being just evicted, you know, mercilessly. And uh, you know, uh, Hun Sen says this is the biggest problem. Uh, that he, he has the greatest regrets, essentially, about the whole issue of land and homes. And uh, I don't know how it's being solved, but there's, there's a lot of problems. There's illegal logging that's going on, in, you know, in the forests. They're cutting the precious woods, you know, the, not even the cheap woods, but, the, you know, rosewood and the really expensive woods. Um, there are serious problems in Cambodia, and one shouldn't sidestep them, including the building of dams. There's a big dam that's going on uh, above, right in Laos, right at the border. Uh, that's supposed to, that can kill about 10% of the fish that people eat. There's questions of food security. Uh, when you're displacing farmers and you have rubber plantations instead, that again affects food security. Um, you know, for instance, having dams in, put it, you know, creating hydroelectric dams in Cambodia is ridiculous because the land is basically level. The slope is so little. This is you know, it, it, it damages the ecology and there's really very little to be gained. I think there needs to be a whole review of what's going on in the environment, in, you know, in land titles. But of course, some of this, as mentioned in the film, is a result of the Khmer Rouge period in which there were no records, nobody knows who owned what. And so we still have this kind of chaos in the country. And I think people need to be compensated, but compensated adequately if they're forced off their land or if they want to sell their land. And sometimes peasants don't know the value of their land, but you saw in that one clip, the peasants are fighting the police. Yes. And they're, I think, <laughs> and they're winning. <laughs> so yeah, this is a very unfortunate thing. By the way, land grabbing is going on all over the world. It's going on in, in Africa. It's going on in Asia. This is a, a phenomenon. You know, uh, there's a limited amount of land. You know, they don't make more land on the planet. So mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's a major concern. Some would say that this action is needed in order to develop a country. What is your input on that? I don't know what develop means. Does develop mean? Uh, Building yeah. a dam in order to develop a country into a more advanced country, the dam is needed. In order to build roads and high-rise building, those people needed to be moved somewhere else so that they could build malls or, you know. Yeah, but who needs malls? Is that the, I, you know, I don't know what development really is. And mm -hmm. I'm not sure, you know, we're sitting here in Southern California. I mean, this is developed, but it's, it's a crazy place and it's crowded and traffic jams. And if that's development, do you want that? Here's an interesting thing I noticed is that when any of the people in Cambodia and Phnom Penh in particular, when you know, the workers get food, how do they get the food? It comes in little plastic bags mm -hmm. and they eat the food. And then what do they do? Trash it. They tr just drop it. On the street. On the street. So you have, you know, there needs to be a kind of forward looking approach to the country. You know, you have limited resources. You don't want to waste them. You want to care for the wildlife areas. I have a friend who runs a big wildlife. He's the head of the big wildlife area in the northeast of the country. And there's constant poaching going on, the killing of animals. 
uh, you know, this is your legacy. You, uh, you want to protect these, you know, these animals. You want to protect the forest because otherwise they'll soon all be gone. And there's no habitat there. It was a wonderful movie I saw about elephants. And so they're losing their habitat in, in Cambodia. And it's the illegal logging, too. Mm -hmm. And everybody knows about it, but turns a blind, blind eye. And of course, in the cities, now you have pollution because of the traffic jams. Uh, you know, if I were God, and, or I was very wealthy, I would, you know, they need to build a rapid transit system, perhaps a sky train like in Bangkok. I mean, there needs to be an overall view of the country. Interestingly enough, uh, Cambodia has a very good, I, I'm sorry, Phnom Penh has a very good water system. Oh. I don't know if you know that. No, it I don't. It was well designed and uh, the pipes aren't particularly good coming from that, but the water coming out of that system is very clean. And so that was a good piece of infrastructure and there needs to be thought given to the infrastructure. And I think the most urgent, there are a couple of urgent, you know, I hate to get on my soapbox, but there are a couple of urgent needs in the country. One of them, of course, is thinking about the country as a whole infrastructure. And the other thing, which is even more important, is education. Because unless people are educated, they don't understand what the problems are. And that is, if you have an educated population, that's, you know, that's the solution. By the way, what is the resource of any country? What's Cambodia's resource? Is it forests? No. You know, is it minerals? No. It's the young people. That is the future of a country. And it's vital that those young people are taken care of and that they're schooled, and not just schooled in elementary school, but schooled in a high level. The Cambodians have demonstrated themselves able to learn. And we see that also in the diaspora, right? The children who came to the United States that I know, uh, they have high positions, they really understand things. The question is, are they going to come back to the country to help Cambodia? Are we, going, are, we <laughs> are you, the Cambodians, are you going to take care of your children? Are you going to get them educated? This is a really important issue. It happens to be a worldwide issue, uh, but I think it's terribly urgent in Cambodia. So if I were God or I were, you know, had the power, I would, uh, you know, really focus on education. It's the future of the country. That's true. I sometimes, I used to go to teach youth leadership throughout the country a few years ago. And what I noticed about the young generation is that they're very eager to learn, especially new information. And I've seen some um, young generation speak on your film. They speak English really well. I haven't been back in the country in the past three years. Is that the case still? There are some highly educated Cambodian young people. They are also computer literate. Uh, there, there are startups going on uh, where they're, I know one startup where they're actually doing programming for people in Singapore. Uh, oh, wow. Yeah, there's, I, listen, the brain power is there. It just needs to be channeled. And if you, you know, if you give a Cambodian an education, uh, they will run with it. I have great faith in youth. Uh, you know, the young people of the country, they're itching to go. Mm -hmm. And I think also that they're going to be this demographic change. This is a very, very young country. And I think that the politics are going to change dramatically. That The country, in my humble opinion, is at the tipping point. It, 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 it's about to change, and I think hopefully for the better. So I'm an optimist. Not always in everything, but in this case, I am optimistic. I do too. I mean, because I have hope in the young generation, which we will talk in the next segment about how the generation gap. In your film, there's a gentleman, I forgot his name, he mentioned broken courage. In Cambodian, it says- Bak Sabat. Ja, Bak Sabat. Now, how, is that still the case for the elder generation that you notice when you're in Cambodia? Do we have time left? Yes, we do. Good. Well, what I've discovered is some parents have talked to their children some haven't. I understand why. Survivors of you know, the concentration camps in Europe had to do terrible things in order to survive. 
and they don't want to either, either relive it or talk about it or admit what they had to do. In the film, uh, some, some of the people talk about how you have to lie, steal, cheat just to survive. And I don't think they want to bring that back. And so, on the other hand, there are some parents who have really, as you'll see in the film, have really told their children everything. You know, I'm of mixed feelings, but I, I think healing comes when you can talk about things, when you can express what you experience. And I'm sure it's a very hard conversation to have to tell your children what you went through, you as an adult. Um, so you have really, there are two cases, those in which the parents did tell or will tell and that those who won't discuss it, they just simply won't talk about it. And history has a habit of repeating itself, they say, and you want people to know what happened. It's very important so it doesn't happen again. That's true, because growing up, I never talked to my mom about you it. You didn't? No, because it's either I didn't want to know the pain or relive the pain, or I didn't want to trigger an old pain. So we never talked about it. And now that I have children, I rarely talk about it unless I see my, food, my kids are wasting a lot of food. And then I would say, hey, you know, I used to starve this and that. And then they would say, why are you not starving anymore? That's right. So they can't relate when I'm trying to bring something up. No, no, up. the kids like, you know, finish your food. You know, otherwise, you know, think of all those starving people in somewhere. Mm -hmm. Well, send it to them. That's yes, what that's exactly yes. what my children yeah, they can't, say. They can't understand. Yes. We will be right back. Let's talk about the current situation by bringing back the interview you had with the Prime Minister Hun Sein. In this clip here, you know what they were shouting at the demonstration? Hun Sen out. It's normal for them to see. They were like a, a step down. But I came up to get her. Came down to He says he 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 will he was elected by the constitution and he will step down according to the constitution and those are nice words but that's not the reality of what's going on in Cambodia right now. What is your opinion on that? Um, well, look at this. Uh, Sam Rainsy, the opposition leader, is in exile, or the former opposition leader is in exile in France. Kem Sokar, who is now the leader of the opposition happens to be under house arrest. Uh, thugs beat up some parliamentarians in front of the parliament. Uh, there was an assassination. Uh, the elections are not free. Uh, it's pretty obvious that, th th that Hun Sen and his people are not playing by the rules of the constitution. Um, you know, the, I hate to say this, but uh, it, the country is run by a kleptocracy, if you know what that means. Uh, it's essentially uh, Hun Sen and his family are getting the spoils. And, but I, I still remain optimistic because this can't go on. I don't think, it, and I think uh, Hun Sen and his party understand that, that they have to somehow incorporate the young people into you know, the politics that they can't cut people out. So I, again, uh, you know, it, the situation is bad right now. It's really bad. And in a sense, Hun Sen is, is channeling Donald Trump. Donald Trump has given sort of uh, the green light to, you know, to dictators all over the world. We're, we're experiencing now worldwide, mm -hmm. essentially a move to the right, to authoritarian control. It's happened in, of course, Cambodia. The military has taken over uh, Thailand. It has happened in, in Burma, although Aung San Suu Kyi is, is uh, sort of in power. The truth of the matter is the country is run by the military. Uh, 
the Philippines, it's Duterte, I, if, I don't know if I mentioned that, uh, in Hungary, in Poland, uh, this is a, a worldwide phenomenon. So Cambodia is not an exception, but I think Donald Trump has set the stage for all these autocrats. It can't go on, and I don't think it will go on. So maybe I'm unrealistic, but as I mentioned, I, I am optimistic. Uh, this is an instable, I teach physics, and we talk about you know stable equilibrium, and we're in unstable equilibrium. Look, if you have a ball, and you have a valley, and you let the ball fall, it will ultimately go to the bottom of the valley. That's stable equilibrium. If you have like a hill, and you have a ball on top, you can get the ball to sit up there, but all it takes is a little bit of wind or somebody to blow on it, and it will go one way or the other. And that's the situation that I think Cambodia is in. Somebody in the film says that if the table is set right, uh, this regime might step down. That is, if they can keep the loot. <laughs> so uh, I don't know. I can't predict the future, but I, I still feel that there's something afoot, that you cannot control this country simply with, with force. Ultimately, things give way. I don't know if democracy is the answer. In order to have democracy, you need to have an educated population. I hate to talk about this, but how did Trump get elected? How did Trump get 40 odd percent of the American vote? And the answer is because we have, you know, the educational system in this country is not good. Uh, we, we have a problem. They're, you're either in the elite schools and, you know, really getting good education or you're in the miserable schools. I think that's the case in Cambodia, right? If you yes. have money, you go to the good schools. And if you don't have money, you end up going, you know, getting a, a really poor education. And even the poor education, you still have to pay the teacher and bribe the teachers. You cannot get homework if you do not pay the teacher under the table. So the corruption in Cambodia is a uh, school is very bad, you know, because it's not just in the higher rank, but also in the school system, which I think is worse than here in the U.S. Now. Um, what do you see the future of Cambodia? I see a, sort of see a bright future. Um, if they can solve the environmental problems and prevent degradation of the environment, if the country opens up, I mean, there is another problem, and that is with the Chinese investments, which are going all over the world. I mean, you, know, they, you know, the Chinese can come and buy out the country. You know, on Diamond Island now, they're, they're building these condos, and the interesting thing is there's a huge number of condos, but people aren't living in them. They're being bought by Chinese and being held, you know, as investments, as empty apartments. Well, obviously, this is an attempt to move money out of China. It's probably black money also. Um, I don't, you know, I don't have all the answers. I just see what's going on. I wish I, you know, I did have answers. I don't have answers, but... Uh, Cambodia has to reclaim itself and it needs to become an independent country and has to resist the outside forces. People, you know, people shouldn't be, t like me, shouldn't be telling Cambodians what to do. Cambodians should be telling themselves what to do. And so I'm just an outsider. I'm just the, you know, look, this film is really a novelist's eye view. It's me looking at a country from the outside and sometimes an outsider can see something in a country that the insider can't. I always like talking to foreigners about America mm -hmm. and having them tell me what they see, especially people who've come here and been here a little while. I, it's wonderful to get an outside view because you get so immersed in your own country that you don't understand really what's going on sometimes. So the outsider says things are gonna change and the outsider happens to be optimistic. I can be proven wrong. That brings to uh, another question that I have is, how long were you in Cambodia to observe what was going on for you to decide, I want to do a film? In, of oh, Cambodia. I came there wanting to do a film. Oh, And I, I see. was there over a four-year period. This is probably the longest I've gone on any film. You know, but, you know, I came, I went back, I took the material and gave it to the studio, and our editors worked on it. And then I realized, oh, we're missing things. So it was back to Cambodia to get the things we're missing. And then 
again, they worked on it. And I bring back a lot. And usually the editor says, oh, no. You know, I say, oh, I just brought you 40 hours. 40 hours, you know. And I just keep bringing material back. But then they're telling me also, you know, we're missing these pieces. Can you talk to people about this? Can you talk to people about that? Can you get more children talking about what their parents have told them? So um, it's, it's a really, you know, it's a big process making a documentary film. That brings to the next question. How do you select who to interview? Well, the interesting thing is I had this woman, Sophia, who appears in, 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 the, in the film, and she brought me people. Once you start, there's a network. Uh, I hit the ground wherever I am. I was just in Mongolia. I hit the ground, and before I hit, I already have a network of people. And it's amazing how helpful people are. These are people who will become my friends, who will help me with the film. They, uh, Cambodians wanted to see this film made, obviously, yes. and they went out of their way to help me. I could never in a million years have made this film without the Cambodians' help. No way. So it, it's, you start the ball rolling or you start the cart moving and everybody is jumping on and pushing the cart and the cart gets bigger and bigger. And so, I, I mean, look, I shot the film. We edited it, but the Cambodians, in a sense, made the film. They, it's, I hope they feel that way, that it, it's their film. It's your film, you Cambodians. Yes, what I love about the film is that you cover every subject that is needed to cover. You cover the history, the Pol Pot, the king, the people, and the current situation. To, and the future. Yes, to giving hope to the, um, for the future. Do this young generation really optimistic about Cambodia, do you think? I think they alternate between being pessimistic and, all, and optimistic. I think when political things happen that are bad, they become pessimistic like everybody else, like you and me. And then I think when, uh, but there is this energy, you cannot hold down young people. Mm -hmm. um, they are, the parents are afraid to speak out, but the youngsters aren't. They will speak their minds. They're, I was amazed how brave many of the young people were. And I was saying, ooh, the things you're saying could get you in trouble. And it was like, I don't care. This is what I feel. And so that's why I'm always optimistic about, you know, I teach, I teach at the university. I teach young people and uh, I, I love them. And I, I like teaching young people. And it's not the job, it's being in contact with them. Because the truth of the matter is, uh, if you're a teacher by your students, you will be taught. That comes from a musical uh, from The King and I, as a matter of fact. And it really is true. I learn from my students. And, and uh, look, I have uh, like two brain cells left and one isn't working, but they've got lots of brain cells. And they can really absorb things and they can reason in a way that the older people can't. So, you know, God bless them. <laughs> yes. Where can the audience watch this film at? Well, the film is on all digital platforms. It's on iTunes. It's on Amazon, Google Play. Also, our distributor, Journeyman Films, Journeyman TV has it. Uh, the best thing is you can go to our website, which is, guess what, anchorawakens.com. And there's a gallery, you can see pictures, you can get information about the history of the country, and it will tell you where you can go in order to, you know, to see the film. So, or you can go to my website, which is Robert H. Lieberman, you have to have the H in there, one word, dot com, and that'll take you to our films, it'll take you to my books, it'll, take, it, it'll open the world to you. So if you know how to use the internet, um, it's all there. The title touches me the most because a few years ago I wrote a poem. I'm not a, I'm not a writer or anything like that, but for somehow it was through the tragic, the land grabbing and all this um, demonstration in Cambodia that got my heart really heavy and I was really heartbroken to see my people suffer. So I wrote something out and I said, I mentioned kind of like sleeping apsara. When will you wake up? Do you see your people suffering? 
you're so beautiful but yet so ugly meaning you know the country is so beautiful but yet what was going on makes it so ugly so when your title a uh, uh, uncle awakens it's like wow I, why didn't i think of that what makes you come up with that title because we think the country is awakening after a long dark period it's it's morning and Right, the sun is rising, and I think that Cambodia is awakening. There's no way that you can keep out outside influences. The young people are, you know, the Facebook generation. They know how to use the internet. They see the outside world, and I think they're hungry for change. I agree. Well, sorry that time has come to an end. I love having you here. Well, Thank you so my much delight. for giving. I'm, I'm honored that you let me address the Cambodian people. I hope to see you back here in town, and maybe we will talk about the what's the current situation and how you know this election just happened. Or are you going to make another film about that? No, I think I've done the, I've done the Cambodian film. Thank you for watching, and good day. Do you, think, do you think about that? Does it have an effect on you? If I survive for today, it's okay, it's fine for me. So I try to survive for tomorrow. So Are you scared? Yes, of course, scared. Yeah. Constantly like, scared? Yeah, or? scared. Yeah. I was so lucky to stick to the same story because if I were to admit it, I'm sure they shoot me dead there and then. They make us uh, not trust each other. You cannot even trust your father, your mother anymore under the family. I feel that I'm very lucky to be here right now in a good time with all the food and everything, water, and I get to go to school. And I feel that I'm very lucky.